I guess the C in CBRN stands for cat. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we are continuing our series on British and Canadian NBCW or CBRN equipment. Now, in the last video, we had a look at post-war Canadian gas masks, and today we're going to look at the full NBCW or CBRN suits that would have been worn along with them. Now, before we get started, I do want to dispel a common misconception regarding how these suits actually work. By and large, military CBRN suits don't actually protect soldiers from direct irradiation, at least not against anything more penetrating than alpha radiation. This is because protecting against penetrating gamma radiation would require so much lead or other heavy shielding that a soldier's mobility would be unacceptably compromised. Rather, CBRN suits prevent radioactive materials such as fallout from a nuclear weapon from getting onto or into a soldier's body, where even alpha radiation can inflict a considerable amount of damage. So while the gas mask prevents this material along with chemical and biological agents from being inhaled and ingested, the suit prevents it from coming into contact with the soldier's skin or getting into their bodies via open wounds. Now, the first CBRN suits, or technically CD, chemical defense suits, used during and immediately after the Second World War were typically constructed of very heavy rubberized material and were very hot and unpleasant to wear, even for short periods of time. Indeed, the Canadian protective clothing set, Toxic Agents Heavy, used throughout the 1950s and 60s, was issued with a special cooling underlayer that had to be soaked in water to prevent the wear from overheating. Soon, however, lighter and more comfortable chemical defense suits were developed, including this one. This is a British number no. 1 Mark 1 CD suit. And this, and the following versions, the Mark 2, 3, and 4, were collectively known by troops as the naughty suit because the pointed hood resembled the hat worn by the fictional character of the same name. Now, looking closely at this, the first thing that strikes me is just how flimsy this material is. The closest thing that I can compare this to is a used dryer sheet. It's very porous and tears very easily. And this was deliberate. These were intended to be disposable. You would wear one for a very brief period of time. And then when it became ineffective and became saturated with chemical weapons, uh, you would discard it and put on a new one. So this was designed to be as cheap and easy to mass produce as possible. Now, the outer layer would be coated with a special compound to slow the penetration of chemical warfare agents while still allowing this to be light and breathable, while the inner layer is impregnated with activated carbon to absorb and neutralize said agents. You'll notice this has an outer layer, but it's only applied to strategic areas of the suit that are prone to high wear. For example, under the arms, where you would be lying down prone on the battlefield, or on the back where you'd be carrying a backpack or other equipment. Now, this is a smock style upper, so it doesn't have a full length opening, just a short one with a pair of Velcro tabs. We also have these little pieces of webbing here for easier manipulation using heavy gloves. So the full suit would have comprised the smock, a separate hood, a pair of trousers, which unfortunately I don't have an example of, over boots and gloves, both inner and outer. And the hood would go over top of the smock, secured with a Velcro tab, as well as an elasticated strap under the chin. And here I have to apologize because it was after I'd finished filming and had returned the mannequin that I realized this hood was supposed to be worn with the bib over top of the suit rather than tucked in. Because, of course, chemical warfare agents could flow directly into the suit. So my mistake. Now, in 1967, the Mark I was replaced by the Mark II, which was nearly identical, except it had a hood integrated into the smock itself, which made it easier to put on and eliminated another seam for chemical warfare agents to seep in. Then in 1976, the Mark II was replaced by the Mark III, which did away with this patchwork system and instead covered the entire suit in a protective cloth layer. And this also integrated pockets. There was a large pocket on the chest, smaller pockets on the sleeves with slots for pens or dosimeters, and finally a pocket on the thigh of the trousers. Then finally, in 1990, the Mark III was replaced by the Mark IV suit like this one, which unfortunately doesn't fit in frame, but I can show you the full suit assembled on a mannequin. 
So the main difference here is that the Mark IV has a full-length zipper down the front with a Velcro placket covering it. This makes the suit a lot easier to put on and take off than the earlier smock variants. Now, just like the Mark III, this has an integrated hood, this time with an elastic in it, so it pulls tightly around the gas mask. And the single chest pocket has been split into two, and we also have pockets on the sleeves and another pocket on the thigh of the trousers, which, as you can see, have tie-on suspenders to hold them up. You'll also notice these gray patches here, and these are for attaching chemical warfare agent detector papers, which we'll look at in the next video. Now, this particular Mark IV is printed in Disruptive Pattern Material, or DPM, camouflage, and this was introduced at around the same time as the Mark IV, which means you'll see late production Mark III's in DPM, as well as early production Mark IVs in plain olive green. Now, the complete Mark IV suit would have consisted of the jacket, the trousers, overboots, double layer gloves, and something called a facelet, which was a simple dust mask that was designed to be worn to provide temporary protection until you could get your proper gas mask on. Though apparently these were really never used, not even in training. And once again, I must apologize for setting up this mannequin incorrectly, the pant legs are actually supposed to go over the overboots so that they don't channel chemical warfare agents directly in the boots. So I guess I wouldn't have made a very good soldier. Anyways, let's hop across the pond to Canada and see what we were using at around the same period. Right, so the standard Canadian CBRN suit for the majority of the Cold War was the Chemical Warfare Protective Clothing Overgarment, which was introduced in the 1960s and used until 2004 when it was replaced by the Horizon 1 CBRN suit. Now, unlike the British CBRN suits, the Canadian suit was a single-piece coverall-style garment. It featured a full-length front zipper with a Velcro pocket, an integrated hood, internal suspenders, elasticated stirrups on the pant legs, and three pockets, two on the chest sized to hold C7 rifle magazines, and one on the thigh for holding maps. Now the outer layer of the suit is made of a cotton nylon blend treated with something called Corpel, which slows the penetration of chemical warfare agents, while the inner layer is made of polyurethane foam impregnated with activated carbon. However, sweat and other moisture accelerates the penetration of chemical warfare agents, while washing the suit decreases its effectiveness by around 10% each time, and it can only be washed around five times before it is unsuitable for battlefield use. And this example that I have right here is a training version, which is clearly marked so that you don't accidentally take this into battle. Now, properly maintained, one of these suits would be rated to provide 21 days continuous protection, while the overboots and the gloves that went along with it are only rated for 24 hours and would have to be constantly replaced. This also provides next to no protection against biological warfare agents, though since most of those are designed to be inhaled, something a gas mask already protects against, this isn't much of a practical problem. Now, since the Canadian suit is one piece, it's considerably more difficult to put on or take off, especially in a combat situation, which makes dealing with life's, let's say, necessaries a little bit challenging. And this raises an important question. How do you go about answering the call of nature in a CBRN suit? Well, the answer is very quickly and very carefully. And indeed, this 1990 British guidebook, Survive to Fight, gives detailed instructions on how to eat, drink, urinate, and defecate while wearing the Mark IV Naughty suit. And I'll put that up on screen for your viewing pleasure.
Right, so the last two pieces of equipment I have to show you here are the carrier bags for Canadian CBRN equipment. This one in pattern 1951, and this one in pattern 1982. And if you want to learn more about the various patterns of post-war Canadian military equipment, please check out the previous video in this series. So along with the complete suits, everything except for the gas mask, these would have carried a variety of equipment for maintaining the CBRN gear and for detecting and treating the effects of chemical weapons. But we will cover all of that auxiliary equipment in the next video. So anyways, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode where we'll finish up our series on CBRN equipment. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.